Our Father, we bless your name for this great privilege to gather before you, to be commissioned by you again, to be challenged to serve it. We're praying that you open our understanding to see all these things so that we'll be able to stand up as a powerful church in the authority of that name. And hell and earth will bow at the mention of the name of Jesus. Write your word upon our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Acts chapter 3, we're studying today from verse 1 to verse 10, and we'll be reading along verse 11. We're starting again our systematic study in the book of Acts. It's the history, the authentic history that God has given and preserved for the church. And as we see these records in the Acts of the Apostles, we see exactly what the church ought to look like. And as I read to you today from verses 1 to 10, and we see the people of God praying, manifesting power as well as praising God, we'll be able to see what the church ought to look like today. Many different people have given us different pictures of the church. Some feel that the church ought to remain powerless with a lifeless, weak message going on in the church and perhaps lifting up a dying light to the world. Other people say no. We should, at, we should at least manifest the life that Jesus Christ had in his own life and among his own disciples. And we should be able to manifest that even today. And with the multiplicity of denominations, sometimes the outsider has difficulty finding out what the church really ought to be. But as we look at Acts of the Apostles, we're seeing the church in normal life. We're seeing the church in day-to-day -day manifestation of power and authority. And uh, today's passage makes us to see both the emphasis and the supernatural manifestation in the church. And it ought to be like that even today. Acts chapter 3, from verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. Verse 4. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, with John said, Look on us. And he gave it unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have given I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood, and walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled 
with wonder and amazement at that which had happened to him. Verse 11, And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. We're dividing these uh, 11 verses into three sections, the scene, the sign, the sequel. And as we look at the setting scene, whereby this man was uh, faced with the naked power of God, miraculous power of God, the supernatural, we see the description of the situation of the man first. Obviously, as you have heard me reading these 11 verses, you know that we're here faced with a miracle. You know, Christianity began in miracles and it is propagated by miracles. Every new birth, you know, is a miracle and every answer to prayer is a miracle. Every victory over temptation is a miracle. In fact, Christianity itself is a life of miracle because it is the very life of God in man. When you talk about Christianity, it is God living in man. It is Christ manifesting his power in man. It is Christ himself coming into man and living in all his power and glory and majesty and grace. And where Christ stays, there is power, there is light, there is compassion, there is love. And the poor are transformed, the lame are healed, the sick, they receive healing for their body. The prayer of faith is a miracle working force in the world. And God channels that miracle working force through the church. And when the church is what it ought to be like the early church, that power is still in manifestation. Listen to me. God is a miracle worker. Jesus Christ was a miracle. Think about Jesus. His birth was a miracle. The announcement of his birth was a miracle. And the adoration of the men, the kings from the east, a miracle. The shepherds leaving their sheep at night and coming to the Lord and worshipping him. What a miracle. Herod wanting to kill Jesus and killing all the children. But Jesus escaping that death, that's a miracle. Jesus going to the wilderness, being tempted of the devil and yet overcoming. That is a miracle. And going out of there saying, All oh, the Spirit of God is upon me. He has sent me to preach the gospel to the poor and to heal the sick. Everything is a miracle. The betrayal, a miracle. The crucifixion, a miracle. The death and the resurrection, a miracle. Coming in to the disciples under closed doors and appearing to them saying, Peace be unto thee. It's a miracle. Coming the eighth day and showing his hand and his feet and his side to Thomas saying, Reach hither your hand and touch the very place and Thomas bind down saying my Lord my God that is a miracle coming back to his disciples and saying all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth that is a miracle Jesus is a miracle and today his name is a miracle it works miracles think about the Bible the whole Bible itself is a miracle book the record of the Bible full of miracles and divine interventions. The preservation of the Bible, full, it's a miracle in itself. The collection of the books of the Bible, a miracle. How God will use men even to translate the Bible into various languages today. Everything is a miracle. It is a history of the outbreakings of the supernatural realm into the natural. Beginning with Abraham, all the major characters of the Old Testament were miracle workers. That is, God wrought miracles through them. Any of the patriarchs of the Bible characters you can name, whenever you mention their names, Israel remembered the miracle working power of God. And as it was, it ought to be the same today. Jesus began his public ministry with miracles. It was a miracle. It was a ministry of miracles. And you know when the church began a ministry in Acts of the Apostles? It was a ministry of miracles. The early church wrought miracles in the authority of the name of Jesus. Think about that name for a moment. Because that is what the church today has. As well as the church of old, the church in the early church. The name of Jesus 
had power in the past, and it still has power today. Power to save, power to heal, power to deliver. He is in his name. What I mean is Jesus Christ himself, his power, his authority is in that name he has given to us all he was, all he did, all he is, and all he will ever be is in that name right now. And every true believer has the right to use that name, that name, that name, the name of Jesus in prayer. See what Jesus himself said the name will do. Mark chapter 16. From verse 17. If you are born again, you have the name. And this is what the name will do. Mark 16, 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, shall they cast out devils. And they shall speak with new tongues, still in his name. Still in his name, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them in his name. And in that name, they shall lay hands on the sick, and uh, they shall recover. That's given to the whole church, to every believer, not only elders now, but to every believer in the church. Because it says, in my name, all these things will happen. And in John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye ask anything, anything in my name, I will do it. That reveals to us the promise in the name, the power in the name, the provision in the name, the heritage we have in that name. And that name gives us whatsoever and anything. Because it says, whatsoever we shall ask in that name, in my name, that I will do. And for this reason, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You know, some people have difficulty. They say the age of miracles is gone, is past. They said, when the last apostle died... All miracles that will ever be performed, everything went away. And we've had theologians, German theologians, English theologians, American theologians, proving to us and telling us that miracles are not for today. Because it's only for the foundation of the church. And they regard the apostles and the prophets of the New Testament as the foundation ministers of the church. And he said, once those apostles and prophets have gone and once the whole books of the Bible are now all together. There is no need for miracles anymore. But let's listen to the words of Jesus. The Lord is telling us that the very reason for miracle is the glory of God. It says, whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. What is the reason? Because of the presence of apostles and prophets? No. Because the books of the Bible are not yet complete, no, but that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The question is, when does Jesus want the Father to be glorified in the Son? Was it only in the first century he wanted God to be glorified in him? No, sir. If you know anything about Jesus, if you know anything about the rapture that Jesus has in the Father. I mean, the, the delight he has in him, the joy he has in him, the desire to do his will and to have him glorified. You know that every time until the last sinner shall be saved, the last sick person shall be healed, Jesus wants his Father to be glorified in the Son. And right here today, Jesus still deserves the glory of the Father, and it says there will be miracles as long as, this, as long as the Son wants the Father to be glorified in him. In fact, he says, if he asks anything, anything in my name, I will do it. And in chapter 15, verse 16, 
Henceforth, I call you not servants, that's verse 15. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Now verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Listen to the rest of it. And that whatsoever, whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, in my name, he may give it to you. In chapter 14, he says, I will do it myself. In chapter 15, verse 16, he says, the Father will do it. What is he saying? He's saying, when you use the name of Jesus in prayer, both the Father and the Son go into activity to work a miracle immediately because that name attracts the attention of the Father and it arrests the attention of Jesus Christ. And at the mention of the name of Jesus, heaven is standing at attention, and hell is trembling, and sicknesses are going away, and miracles wrought in supernatural power, they are happening, because Jesus and the Father will go to work when you pray and you mention the name of Jesus. Look at chapter 16 of John. Chapter 16, verse 23. And in that day, ye shall ask me nothing. Listen to me before I go on. You know, many people have made mistakes in prayer. They have not gone to, to God in prayer as Jesus said. Now, you know people that say, when they pray, they say, Jesus, heal me. Jesus said, no, go to the Father, talk to the Father, but mention my name to him. Don't come and talk to me directly. Don't say, Jesus, heal me. Jesus, save me. Jesus, bless me. He says, in that day, that's the day he would have gone. After the ascension, in that day, ye shall ask me nothing. He says, don't talk to me directly. Talk to the Father. Talk to God. But when you are talking to him, talk in my name. Now go on. Verse 23. In that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father, the Father, ask the Father. Change your pattern of praying. Ask the Father. Don't ask the angels, they're just ministering servants. Don't ask Jesus Christ directly. He himself has told us and pointed us to the right direction in praying. Ask the Father. Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, in my name, in my name, he will give it you. Don't ask in your own name. You don't have any account in heaven. Don't ask in the name of the founder of your church. You don't, he doesn't have any account there. Don't ask in the name of any human being, any human being. But ask the Father in the name of Jesus, and he says, he will give it to you. Verse 24, hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. What does that mean? He's saying, Peter, John, James, Matthew, Bartholomew, Nathaniel, all my disciples, you know, at the stormy sea, when there was a storm, you came to me and you, you just woke me up. Carest not that, that we perish? You have not been asking the Father in my name, either to, up to this point, you have not been asking in my name. But now ask, and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. And the thing we're reading in Acts chapter 3 is just one of the examples of the use of that name in prayer. And as we look at these verses, we're looking at the scene now. Verses 1 to 3. Let's see the stage that is set for the miracle that is before us today. And in the scene, we have two sections. We see the praying ministers and the paralyzed man. 
Now the praying ministers, now Peter and John, went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Let me introduce you to this, uh, to these people, Peter and John. Peter and John. One, you'll see that they were both fishermen before the Lord called them. And apparently they had known one another before they were even called of the Lord, before they were saved. After they were saved, they, they came into what uh, we call the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And if you will look at um, the list of the apostles given in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the uh, Acts of the Apostles, you'll discover something. There were always four of the twelve apostles coming first. Always four. And these four are Peter, John, James, and Andrew. Any list that you examine in the Gospels and in Acts of the Apostles mentioning the twelve apostles, those four were always together. Because, you know, their call had brought them together. Apart from that, they were always at the feet of Jesus Christ. When he went to the Mount of Transfiguration, these three were there, Peter, James, and John. But then there were other times that at the time of Jesus Christ, just the two of them were linked together. In Luke chapter 22, for example. Luke 22, verses 7 and 8. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. So even before Jesus Christ died, there had been times both of them were linked together. After Jesus Christ died, and they received information that Jesus rose from the dead. You know the two disciples or the two apostles that ran to the sepulchre together, Peter and John. And we're told John got to the sepulchre first. But then Peter came from behind and he went into that sepulchre and discovered the clothes in which Jesus Christ was tied when he was buried and couldn't see Jesus there. So both of them again at the resurrection of Jesus Christ were at the sepulchre to check up um, that he had risen from the dead. And there is a case here before us right now. When we read that, they are now going up to the temple together, Peter and John. And in chapter 4, verse 13, they appeared before the council together. Acts 4, verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. In chapter 8 of Acts, when revival broke out in Samaria, and the apostles in Jerusalem needed to send apostles to Samaria so that they can minister to them of the Holy Ghost. Who did they send? Peter and John again, a powerful pair. In Acts chapter 8 verse 14, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. So in chapter 3 of Acts, we're introduced to these two men, two ministers, two apostles. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. Something is significant. Whenever these two were together, Peter was always talking. John was always quiet. You see, there were different temperaments. John was of a quiet, leaning, meek, lowly temperament. But you know Peter. He is a talking type. And even before Jesus left, we're told that John will just lean at the bosom of Jesus Christ, but Peter will speak out his mind. You know, it is possible for God to link two workers together. 
and one is very outgoing, vocal, dynamic, aggressive, and the other is very quiet and reserved, and yet for God's own purpose in the work of the Lord, they are still joined together, they appear together to do the work of the Lord. And you'll find that on the Mount of Transfiguration, John was there, Peter was there, James was there. When, um, Pete, when uh, Peter saw that Elijah appeared, Moses appeared, who talked among the three? James did not talk, Jesus, uh, John did not talk. It was Peter that said, Jesus, let us build three tabernacles. He was always talking. At this time in Acts chapter 3, when they saw the lame man, and the lame man was looking at both of them, who talked? Peter. In Acts chapter 8, when they went to Samaria, and uh, they laid hands on, uh, on the people, and they were receiving the Holy Ghost, and Simon uh, offered money so that whosoever he lays his hand upon, the person will receive the Holy Ghost. Who talked to rebuke Simon? Peter. Look at Acts chapter 8. Verse 19. Saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. And yet, listen, it was John that God used to give us the deepest, the greatest of all the four Gospels. The Gospel according to St. John. It was John that God used to give us the greatest and the deepest and the highest of all revelations in eschatology, the book of Revelation. And he writes to the church three letters, and those three letters, the epistle to, of John uh, to the church, the first, the second, and the third, and they are so deep in meaning, sublime. So these two are joined together, and they have their parts and their place in the church. And now we are told in Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. The Greek word that says they went up, we are told, is an imperfect sense. That means they were continually going to the temple. That means every day they were going to the temple. Look at Acts chapter 2 verse 46. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, and they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Look at Luke, chapter 24, verse 53. And were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Continually, they were in the temple. That means every time they were going to the temple at the time of prayer. Now, another point we want you to notice is that even though Jesus had given the authority and the name to the apostles, they were still dutiful in praying. You see, God has given us promises, He has given us the name of Jesus. He has given us the power in the Holy Ghost. But then it doesn't work automatically if we're not prayerful. Some people feel, well, if I have the promises, why should I pray? If I have the power, why should I pray? If I have the authority in the name of Jesus, why should I bother myself praying and praying and praying every time? Listen to me. Before that thing can work, which God has given you, you must back it up with a life of faith and a life of prayer. You have a right hand. You were born with that right hand. But you learn to use that right hand by using it and using it and using it every time. You have a mouth and you have vocal cords. You know, if you never practice how to talk, how to speak, the tongue will be there, the lips will be there, the mouth will be there, the vocal cords will be there, but you will not know how to talk. We learn to do something by doing it. And we learn to uh, use the name of Jesus by praying in that name. 
by giving ourselves to prayer. Even though they were apostles, they were still dutiful in prayer. They were praying ministers. And in Acts chapter 6 verse 4, we here see their commitment to a life of praying, their commitment to a life of seeking the face of God. If God has started using you in praying for the sake, helping the needy, able to proclaim the power in the name of Jesus, and that name is working as you pray, remember, it will work more if you pray more. If you dedicate yourself to a life of prayer, waiting upon the Lord, in Acts chapter 6 verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. We will give ourselves. Are you giving yourself like that? Yes, we have that name. Yes, we have that authority. Yes, that name will do the same thing today as it will do in the past. But we must commit ourselves to a life of praying. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. The Jewish day began at 6 o'clock in the morning, 6 a.m. And there were three hours of prayer, 9 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock in the afternoon, and 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And these are the three times of prayer. 9 o'clock will be their third hour, three hours after 6. 12 o'clock will be the sixth hour, six hours after six in the morning. Three o'clock in the afternoon will be the ninth hour, ninth hour after six o'clock in the morning. And this time it was three o'clock in the afternoon. And it was the time of the evening sacrifice for the, for the Jewish people. And now they were going into the temple to pray. Now... This thing I want to tell you now is very, very important. Very, very important. For those who are learning on how to pray, who are learning about the move of the Holy Ghost, who are learning about how to minister to the needy. You know, we have many young people, and uh, they say, we have the name of Jesus, we have the power of God, and any time we can pray. But you see, there is something you don't understand. This man, for example was 40 years of age at this very time. He had been carried to this temple, to the gate of the temple, for many, many, many years. And yet, listen to me. Peter and John had been going to this temple before. Do you know that they had seen this man before? Maybe before they had even given him arms, money. Why didn't they at that time just lay hands on him, tell him to rise up in the name of Jesus. That's what an immature believer will do. That's what somebody will do if uh, you are not being led by the Holy Ghost. But you know, Peter and John, they had, they had been with Jesus Christ. In healing the sick, we apply the wisdom of God. And we allow the Lord to lead us at a particular time. You know, whenever we come here on Thursday, sometimes you are here and um, the first time you come, we may not minister to your need, but you ought to be able to know that the Holy Ghost is working and you come again. And at a particular time, your case may come to God's attention or to the attention of the man of God that is praying and then you are ministered to. Is it that the previous Thursday, there was no power to heal. There was always power to heal. But then the timing of God at this time, this particular time, the Holy Ghost led and moved and controlled the very actions of Peter and John. And the miracle came. You must always listen to God. You must not feel that, well, the use of the name of Jesus is just automatic. That's why the believers don't go to the hospitals and, you know, just uh, get into that hospital and say, rise up in the name of Jesus, rise up in Jesus' name, rise up in Jesus' name, and bring confusion everywhere. That's why a real person, a child of God that has been led of God, does not go to a uh, Tinumbu Square or to the streets and then uh, they say, what are you doing? Well, I've got the name of Jesus. 
and he stands he stands right in the in the middle of the road while the vehicles are coming and he said you know uh, praying for a layman saying rise up in jesus name rise up in jesus name that is not how to do it those are children and they just hear one word and they run with the one word come back to the church and learn so you see peter and john they have been passing that way very very often but now the spirit of the living god moved in such a mighty way now let me say a word to those who, are, who may be sick do you know that sometimes uh, you know sick people they're so much in a hurry and uh, they come to the Thursday meeting one time, just once. And uh, they say, well, if I go there today and I don't get anything, I will not go again. He doesn't know the word of God. Are you going to control God? Why not keep on coming? You see, this lame man had been carried to this place often and often and often and often. I see that, you know, some people who are coming before in their wheelchairs, they came two times or three times and they said, well, I thought uh, the power of God will come upon me and just heal me. Since God has not done it after two times, I don't think I want to waste my time and go again. But you see, this lame man was always there, always there. And his time came. And if you are sick, your time is coming in Jesus' name. Amen. Now verse 2. Let's see the paralyzed man. Verses 2 and 3. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked, and arms he was looking for money god gave him a miracle you know god will answer our prayers many many times beyond what we are asking in ephesians chapter 3 ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Many times our prayers are limited. Our expectations are limited. We come to the Lord and we come to the church of God with a limited expectation. But you know, God will sometimes and many times go beyond our request and give us more than we are asking. He looked at Peter and John about to go into the temple to ask arms. How old was this man? Chapter 4, verse 22. Acts chapter 4, verse 22. For the man was above 40 years on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Above 40 years. We've seen the praying, prayerful ministers, and we've seen the paralyzed man. Now, I want to go to the sign. And in the sign, we, we see the use of, in the name of Jesus, bringing instantaneous healing. Verse 4. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. Verse 5. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Please don't forget that the church has got the name of Jesus. The church has got the authority that Jesus gave to the church. The church has got the manifestation of power, the Spirit of God, the power of the Holy Ghost. And uh, you need to understand this. You see, this lame man, he did not know the supernatural, the miracle-working power of God in the lives of these apostles. He was expecting to receive something 
of them because many religious people have gone into that temple and they have put money into his hands. They have put coins into his hands. And now these people were coming and he looked at them expecting, asking alms from them and Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John and he said, look on us. And that made him to have, to have more expectation to receive money. Only to be disappointed by what Peter said, silver and gold have I none. What disappointment this man will have temporarily. How many times we can go to the zonal leader and we tell him our needs, financial needs. And the zonal leader will say, well, do you know, brother, sister, friend, we just don't have any amount of money we can give you now on charitable uh, basis. How disappointed you become. And sometimes because you don't have that charity or that amount of money, you say, what's the use in coming to the church? You have missed the whole point. The apostles may be poor, but they are powerful. The apostles may not have money, but they can give miracles in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostles may not be able to give you expectation, what you require, what you want at the particular moment, but if they can just kneel down and pray on your behalf, heaven will be opened and showered upon you. So temporarily, the man could have been disappointed. But now look at verse 6. Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. Before I go on, let me branch a little bit. I like to talk to people who are pastors like myself, teachers like myself. I like to talk to people who are in charge of churches because you may be here tonight and God has given you the opportunity to be a pastor or the founder of a ministry. And, uh, you know, you tell your congregation, uh, you know, I am your pastor here, I am your teacher here. It's a wonderful privilege. But let me tell you something. There is something in the life of Peter, in the life of John, that we ministers of the gospel, pastors in the church and teachers in the church, we ought to learn and we ought to live a lifestyle like that. Look at chapter 2. Verse 45. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. You see, in the early church, all the members of the church, whenever they saw any need in the church, they will sell their possessions and they will bring the money to the church. You tell me, who were the people in charge of the whole money brought into the church? The apostles. In fact, in chapter 4 of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse 34 and 35, Neither was there any among them that lagged, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and it laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Peter knew money. He saw money. Because, you see, many people in the church, as they were selling their property, the whole money they were bringing to the apostles' feet, and when the money was counted, Peter knew the amount. But let me tell you something. Peter had no personal access to the spending of that money the way he lied. You know, if anybody ought to be carrying money around in the early church, it ought to be Peter and John. Peter the spokesman, the person that is always in charge. From Acts chapter 1, when they were going to choose the 12 apostles to replace Judas Iscariot, who was the one talking? Peter. In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Ghost came and they were speaking in tongues, who was the person talking on behalf of all the others? Peter. In chapter 3, as we are now confronted with the miracle, who was the one talking? Peter. 
in chapter 4 when uh, the council called them who was the one talking Peter again in chapter 5 when Ananias was judged who was the one talking Peter again and as you go on in Acts of the Apostles you see the uh, primary place the front line the location position that Peter held and yet with all that he said silver and gold have I none pastor let me ask you if your church is rich if members in the church are generous and they're bringing in the money doesn't it pass into your account part of it so that eventually when you die there are houses in your name bosses in your name cars in your name landed property in your name it must not be like that the money is not for the pastor it's for the church and so we thank God for a person like Peter, like John. With all the money coming in to the apostles to distribute to the need of the church, they could still say silver and gold have I none. So now leader, you too, you are in a position where, you know, sometimes the people in the zone, they contribute money for the work of the Lord to be done, to help needy people to arrange transportation in your zone. Can you say like Peter, like John? With all the money that has been contributed in your zone, or as an area leader, as fellowship leader, can you say that you have never touched any part of that amount of money? Can you say with Peter and John, silver and gold have I known? Listen to me. Listen to me. This is important. The farther you are away from money, the nearer you are as an apostle to the miracle working power of God. If money is near, Miracles will be far away. If money is far away, miracles will be near. Think about it. If you bog yourself down with money, with property, with the things of the world, and you misuse the things of the church, the property of the church, you cannot at the same time manifest the power of God. If money is far away, miracles are near. Now, in chapter 3, verse 6, Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That's the name. The name of Jesus. That's all the power. You know, many times the people who do not understand was the secret of a growing church. Well, they say maybe there is a juju they are using. You know, a man will be totally foolish to have the powerful, dynamic, miracle working name of Jesus Christ and still be looking for juju. Because the name of Jesus is greater than magic, the name of Jesus is greater than the devil, the name of Jesus is greater than any medicine. And if you can have the name of Jesus, you will be a foolish man to toss the name of Jesus aside and be looking for medicine somewhere. There is no medicine we're using here. Some people feel, well, on Thursday we see people rushing there, rushing there. Maybe they have a type of juju they are using. You don't know something. The name of Jesus is greater than what you are thinking about. In that name, the blind receive their sight. In that name, the, the lame are walking. In that name, the lunatic, they are, they are recovering. In that name, devils are being cast out. In that name, miracles are happening every time because at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Look at verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Why, ye, why look ye so earnestly on us? As though by our own power or holiness we made, we had made this man to war. Verse 16, his name, through faith in his name has made this man strong, whom ye see and know, ye, the faith which is by him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. It's all in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 10. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. The power is in that name. The apostles were poor materially. They chose to be that way. They could have been rich if they wanted to be rich. If they wanted to be getting money on everybody that was healed, they could have been rich. But the more money that comes in, the more the miracles will be far away from them. So they chose to be poor materially. And the apostles were poor materially, but powerful to work miracles through the authority in the name of Jesus. Jesus gave the church the power of attorney. That is, the legal right to use his name. The measure of the ability of his ability is the measure of the value of that name. And all that is invested in that name belongs to us even today. For Jesus gave us the unqualified use of his name. Now let's see the healing. Verses 7 and 8. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. It was an instantaneous healing. He was begging for arms. The apostles, through the power of God, gave him legs. And this is an instant of healing and deliverance. And it's a miracle from God. Supernatural, sudden, sufficient. The power to heal was Christ's, but the hand that God used was Peter's. And that's the same thing God is doing today. You remember Gideon? He says, the sword of God and the sword of Gideon. Because God chooses to walk in partnership with his own people. We have the mouth to pray. God has the power to heal. We have the voice to call upon the name of God. And to call on the power of God to heal the sick through the name of Jesus. The voice is ours, but the manifestation of power belongs to God. That's what he does today. He channels his power through us. Now in the last three verses, verses 9 to 11, we see the sequel. The thing that happened after this sign given to the people around to show the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Let's see from verse 9. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. One of the consequences of miracle healing is that the person healed begins to glorify God, begins to praise the name of the Lord. Let me remind you of what we read in John, chapter 16, verse 24. John 16, 24. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. This man, who had been lame, paralyzed from birth, now more than 40 years of age, suddenly, instantaneously, supernaturally received a miracle of healing. And his joy was full. He had never walked. He started walking and jumping and leaping and praising God. He brought glory to God. And if you have been healed by God, touched by God, in any of the meetings we have had here, you ought to have praised the Lord. You ought to have given your testimony as well because, you know, when you are healed like that, one way of showing your gratitude to God is to voice it out, is to tell people around and tell the whole church that the power of the Lord has quickened your mortal body. Now look at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verses 40 to 43. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when, when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? 
And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith has saved thee. And immediately he received his sight. And followed him, doing what? Glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. I'm asking you a question. Since the Lord healed you in a miraculous way in on a miracle, revival day, healing day? Have you glorified God in the assembly of the saints here? Have you come forward to give the glory to God, what great things he has done for you? Luke chapter 13. Verse 12 and verse 13. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, Thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight. And see what she did? She glorified God. After receiving a miracle from the Lord, it is important and necessary that we praise and worship the Lord. Now, let's see the reaction of the people to the miracle. Acts chapter 3, verse 10. And he knew that it was he which sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And the lame man which was healed held Peter and John. All the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. Wonder and amazement seized them. The people were so happy because of what the power of the name of Jesus Christ had done. And then look at verse 11 again properly. The lame man which was healed held Peter and John. He's saying, I will not let you go. I have been healed. I'll stay around. I'll stay with you. And he was so joyful. And do you know what? He stayed through for the message, the sermon that Peter gave after the people came together. And when the other people got saved, he too believed on the Lord and was saved. Healed, received a miracle for the body, then saved and received a miracle for his own soul. The people who come here and are healed, if they are going to do according to the people of the Bible what they did, you ought to be staying along, staying through, that now that you are healed, you are holding on to the members of the church and you are saying, here is my church now. If God has done this for me, I will never leave the people of God. If God has healed you, praise him, worship him, glorify his name, and then keep on with the people of God and if you have seen people that God has healed, you ought to come around and hear what is the reason for the healing. Rise up and let us pray. <laughs> power is still available today and our power has been given to the church. If you are a member of the church, that name is on your lips and that name will work wonderful miracles as you pray in the name of Jesus. Now you open your mouth and talk to the Lord and pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. The name. The name. The name of Jesus. It will save the sinner. It will heal the sick. It will deliver the oppressed. It will work miracles. It's the name, the name, the name of Jesus.